right, so this is going to explain, to the best of my ability, what we learned today and what we're looking at. We're basically looking at venous drainage, cerebral spinal fluid leaks, uh, arterial blood supply going in, vertebral arteries, because uh, that uh, brings blood to the back of the brain, back half of the brain, bottom of the brain, visual centers. Uh, so those are the things that we are looking at. The other possibility was because of the one of the mechanisms of injury was going over the railroad tracks in an automobile real fast, that there might be a tethered cord. That is when the, when somebody's injured down at the, at the pelvis, that the, the cord will kind of get injured and it'll kind of connect itself. It'll get matted down and it's called tethered cord because it'll actually pull the brain and the cord down uh, because we have a Chiari Zero, a three millimeter tonsillar ectopia uh, cerebellar tonsil ectopia that we're not showing on MRI here. All we're showing today is a CT scan and x-rays. Uh, CT with venous phase. Okay, so, and we need to show a normal anatomy. Well, you know what, we should start with normal anatomy. All right, so one of the things that people get in trouble with when they go to the doctor is if their anatomy is a little different. Uh, are you gonna give me a cup? All right, so if somebody has a vascular anomaly that the doctor doesn't usually see, it's hard for them to put in their minds. So normal anatomy, uh, let's give you some orientation here. This is the front, the eyes are here, the top of the head is removed, sorry. There we go, that might be a little better. Okay, so the venous drainage, we have a superior sagittal sinus that runs through this center, comes down, we have dual, dual drainage, and it comes down to the jugular veins. This is normal anatomy. Uh, some people are born with only one jugular vein, functionally, uh, where it's, it's dominant and the other one's hypoplastic. And then when that dominant one gets pinched or compromised, it's as if they have two jugular veins compromised. Uh, so there's a couple of um, couple moving parts here to pay attention to. And these are shades of gray pathology that we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about pressure gradients. Uh, it's not like looking at a broken leg where you can see it clear on x-ray and, and it's indis indisputable. Uh, this, the cerebral spinal fluid drains into the venous system by a pressure gradient. That is, there has to be less pressure in the venous system for the cerebral spinal fluid to drain correctly in, into the system. And if, and if you don't, you can have all kinds of problems that are very perplexing and, and confounding. So we're gonna start simply. So here is an x-ray. We see that the weight bearing is going over to the right. The atlas is shaped as though it's holding a sphere and standing on a sphere. The atlas has gone up to the left to the tune of 2.8 degrees. Uh, this matters to us when it comes to uh, making sure the cerebral spinal fluid doesn't have any turbulence going through there or the venous system is open. Uh, this atlas can put, can put pressure on veins and even vertebral arteries. So let's get these, let's get that out of the way. Okay, we'll come here. Let's be right, put it, build everything back for orientation. All right. So one of the things we notice is that you've got some interesting adaptation. I'll tell you what, this is the arterial phase. This is better to show it on the venous phase. She's she has such a hard time draining vein, get draining blood out of her head. It's almost like she has this extra jugular vein on the right. The body is even, or the head, the bot, not the body, the head. The head has venous drainage coming out of the face quite a bit, and there it's a, a very hard to quantify and qualify venous drainage problems. Uh, that's why they seem to be misunderstood and ignored because it's just it, it bogs the doctor down. It's too complicated. Um, okay, so here. You already know what normal anatomy looks like. This is her, you can see that the jugular vein on the right is dominant, that's the one that she mainly drains out of. And ultrasound shows that the one on the left doesn't have much drainage. Actually, quite frankly, neither one of them have much drainage uh, like we'd like it to. We'd like it to open up and be better. So here you can see, uh, we'll just show it on this side, that the jugular vein on the left has an atlas bordering one side, and you can't see the styloid process there, but we'll show it to you in a minute moment and then on the other side 
same thing, stylus, process, jugular vein, atlas. Now we're going to remove some of this anatomy. All right. So we have a styloid that's been elongated. This is the main dominant venous drainage that she has. The one on the left really is not functioning very well. And when she was on the couch with her head down, uh, when, when somebody that has a calcified styloid like this, when they have their head down, these two approximate and it pinches the jugular vein. Uh, so you have your head down for a prolonged period of time watching TV or something, and we've seen that before. This is, you're not the first person that, that this happens to. Um, so when that happens, we have a venous congestion, we have a backup of pressure inside the head, and once that happens, then we can have other problems like uh, a cerebral spinal fluid leak. Now, the leak, what happens is that the, the brain and the cord pressurizes, and we can have a leak down, down in the bottom, in the pelvis, in the lumbar, thoracic, cervical, anywhere. And once that depressurizes, the brain will sag. We, remember, we have a three millimeter uh, cerebellar tonsil ectopia, which means it's sagging out through the foramen magnum. So we already know that right through, right through this hole here, the brain is, is sagging. So what could cause that? Two things that we know that could cause that, uh, a cerebral spinal fluid leak and or a, a tethered cord down at the bottom, which will pull everything down. Now we've also seen an atlas subluxation uh, cause tur turbulence in there, and with an adjustment, the, the brain will rise back up. So after the adjustment today, when you felt that thing go over, over your whole body, mm -hmm. uh, well, it was either the decrease in turbulence, that the cord is no longer shaking back and forth, and or you felt the venous drainage where the blood just the back of pressure venous drainage drains out and you feel it flush through your whole body. Uh, so uh, people will talk about feeling, they can actually feel the liquid draining out of their head. Sometimes it's a flush. Other times when we make an adjustment to the atlas, people will be describing something like a vertebral artery that gets opened up. So they'll talk about, they'll say, man, one side of my head got warm or my ear got warm. And what's happening is that the atlas is out of place and then we move it back to back off the off the uh, away from the brain or skull rather and let's get a better orientation here okay so here we have this on the right side you have this extra little calcification of bone there and when you bring your head back we can see that this is going to come in contact with that vertebral artery uh, we also noticed and we're not going to show you today but when you turn your head to the left or to the right that the atlas moves a lot more than we'd like it to be. I'm not going to say you're unstable, but I'm going to say you're hypermobile. And this atlas swinging around can put pressure on vertebral arteries back and forth. Now, the vascular surgeon that I talked to, he says, it's okay, you've got two vertebral arteries. One of them can back up or, you know, compensate for the other one when you turn your head. And there's, and there's this kind of thing. Um, all right, well, some people can adapt better than others. And people with connective tissue disorders or hypermobility they have difficulty in there too. All right, so uh, you did not talk about a warmth in your head, so I don't think there was a, uh, a released vertebral artery or anything. I think it was more of a jugular vein and or turbulent CSF correction there. Now here's the other little caveat on you. I think you're one of these people that's born with kind of a high pressure. So we looked inside the cranial ball here and these transverse sinuses should be a lot more robust. They both look hypoplastic, uh, and I'm not the only one talking about that. Uh, one, of the, one of the other doctors mentioned uh, a stenosis in there, and they were even talking about on the right. You know what, I actually got some pretty good snapshots of that. So let's go over here, and... Uh, all right, there's, there's a right vertebral artery, extra bone that we talked about. Deviated septum, really you should get that fixed. You'll breathe better, uh, yeah, and, and you'll have more energy, and that's good for you. Uh, here we can see the atlas really coming up close to those jugular veins. Um, another shot of it, another shot of it. All right, these are, this is the hypoplastic left transverse sinus, and the right one has a little stenosis in there. So neither one of them, and I, I stared at this for a while. How are you draining blood out of your head? You don't, uh, 
you don't seem to be doing it very well. Now this is a shot you can't really see, orientation is not so good, but it's an aerial view shot of me going looking at your vertebral arteries bilaterally, and then as they come into the basal artery, and then they go into this circle of Willis, uh, and then actually I, I watched it as it goes through and turns into the vein. So one of the things that is also on our radar is checking for an AV fistula, make sure, making sure there's no, the connection between the artery and vein didn't get blown out. And man, I, I, I spent some time dissecting it. And I guess this is as good of a picture as I can get of it. Um, right, so when you, when you back up your venous system, the two things you think of are CSF leak and or an AV fistula. Uh, either one of those could be causing a, a great deal of symptoms. Um, let's see. Any questions? Anybody? That was pretty good, right? Okay. Well, I think that answered a lot. Oh, and time will tell us. So today we adjusted the atlas. You felt the, the kind of the toilet flush, the, the drainage um, as the days go by. Three days is typically what we notice. I was, I was a patient first. So for me, I had what you had, by the way. I feel like I'm looking at my twin here. So in my case, uh, we had a C I had a CSF leak that we never really, well, we did kind of find it, but it's not really documented so well. Long story short, my atlas got adjusted. I noticed nothing for three days, but my, vein my veins got uh, opened up. After three days of the veins draining a lot better than they were, the, the pressure came out of my head and the CSF leak was able to kind of stop, slow, and, and heal in my case. Sometimes we have to do blood patches. Sometimes we do blind blood patches because finding a CSF leak can be so difficult and the technology is kind of limited. Uh, I don't even know how many uh, photon counting CT machines there are in the country. I think there was only three last time we looked um, to find these venous fistulas. So there's little thin, where the dura is kind of thin, uh, multiple locations and people will pop through there. So what is our current working diagnosis? You had two mechanisms of injury. One, you went over the railroad tracks really hard, which could have caused an increased CSF leak somewhere, could have caused some ligament instability, uh, the atlas going out of place. So you were just waiting, you know, loose and unstable. And then when you sat on the couch too long and then went, went up, we think you compressed your veins a little bit, causing a little extra leak, CSF leakage because it's back pressure. And then the brain sagged down a little bit more and the symptom you had was a brain sag. Um, and you do have MRVs over time that have shown that the transverse sinuses here have gotten more and more hypoplastic. They've gotten even smaller. Well, what would cause that? Well, there's a few things that would cause, but, but the main thing we're thinking is a CSF leak and or tethered cord. Anything that's pulling the brain down could cause that. So uh, we did the simplest, easiest thing today, which is gonna be part of your solution. But I'm, whatever you need is what you're gonna get if, if we're gonna, check you for a tethered cord, we're going to check you for CSSF, CSF leaks, we're going to function as a, a patient advocate for you because very often for somebody to feel amazing I got to get them uh, to a doctor that will remove the styloid and so you're going to do better from what I did today. Uh, the next step may be to remove the styloid so it could very easily be that you feel better but then when you bring your head down it chokes this thing out and everything comes back. I'm like Wow, so then we just gotta get you on, on the surgical schedule with a doctor that'll remove those. And we've got a pretty good relationship there. So we can get that thing removed and that might ultimately be what you need to, to get over and to have a normal life. Um, or having the CSF leak patched. Or, either way, we're not gonna leave you, nor forsake you, because we work for Jesus. Amen.